Happy week six, everyone. Um, this week's module looks at the experiences that people have with physical illness, physical disability, um, and mental illness. And I think uh, particularly with these two chapters, a lot of the information is super straightforward. So there isn't a whole lot, I think, that you need me to elaborate on. Although if you have questions on something, please feel free to email me. As always, I hope that you always feel free to email me if there's something in the material that's confusing that I don't cover in the lectures. Um, what I want to talk about in this first lecture for this module is to elaborate a little bit on um, the book's reference to alternative kinds of medicine. Um, they, the, the author, um, Weitz, she refers fairly briefly to what other alternative kinds of medicine people seek out. Um, so I want to elaborate on that a little bit here. Um, before we get into that, let's talk briefly about why people seek health care. This appears in your textbook specifically um, in reference to the health belief model, right? So the health belief model says that people will seek treatment for some kind of ailment that they have if first they perceive a threat, right? So they have to think that they are not only susceptible to getting that disease, right? Like that they are vulnerable to getting that disease, but also that that disease poses a serious threat, right? So that that it's a serious condition that is going to do them harm. Second, there's this sort of cost-benefit um, analysis, sort of, right? That, that there have to be, the benefits of treatment have to outweigh the barriers that people face in getting treatment. Barriers like being able to travel, being able to pay for it. If they can find a way to minimize those barriers and they believe that the treatment is going to be beneficial to them, then they are going to, the health belief model argues that they are going to seek treatment. And the third one that your book doesn't really talk about, but people who talk about the health, health belief model elsewhere discuss this third point. Um, people are going to seek treatment if they receive cues, external cues to act, right? To go to the doctor, to comply with the doctor's orders, um, and that implies that they're also psychologically ready to seek treatment. So some kinds of cues that people might get are cues from um, the media saying that they should seek treatment or from magazines or newspapers, um, friends and family or other people who give advice, um, a reminder postcard from the doctor, somebody else close to you having an illness that might sort of um, light a fire under you to go and seek treatment yourself. Um, so that's the health belief model. Now your book also discusses some critiques of this health belief model, right? And they center around these two questions of how do you explain non-compliance? Non-compliance meaning the doctor tells you to do something and you don't do it. So you're not complying with the doctor's orders. So how do you explain non-compliance? Well, the health belief model, um, argues or assumes that, people don't comply because they have psychological problems rather than external factors. Like for example, as I mentioned, a lack of resources, or maybe the person that they've been dealing with didn't explain the treatment or the disorder very well. And so they don't want to, or feel a need to go forward with treatment. Um, and there's also an assumption that compliance is always a good thing, right? There's this um, sort of assumption built into the work that people in traditional medicine do that they know what's best for the patient, better than what the patient knows, right? And compliance is particularly difficult when it comes to chronic pain. The other part of this is that um, what's sort of implied in the health belief model is that it's an individualistic um perspective, right? That the person is irrational, but that it's all about the person and not about the system. Now, it's possible that a person may be non-compliant because, as I mentioned, they they are not getting um, the right kind of information or a full description of what's going on. They may also um, be unsatisfied with the type of options that they have available to them. And under the health belief model, doctors would assume that the patients don't want to get well. 
So there are some issues there. Um, and so what you see then is a, um, a, an increase in people seeking out alternative forms of medicine, right? So they're turning away from um, traditional medicine toward what's called complementary and alternative medicine, or CAM for short. So complementary and alternative medicine. And there are a couple of different um, types of treatment that are included under this umbrella of CAM, and I'll outline a few for you here. So the first is osteopathic medicine, which was developed by Andrew Taylor Still in the 1860s. And the idea here is that um, is that you're taking a whole person approach. So osteopathy emphasizes a whole person approach to treatment and care. Um, and so they receive special training in the musculo, musculoskeletal system, right, which is the interconnected system of nerves, bones, and muscles. And so they argue that spinal dislocation, for example, is a cause of illness. And this holistic approach emphasizes that dis dysfunction in one organ is going to affect other organs. This has not always been embraced by the traditional medical field. Um, it was deemed as quackery by the American Medical Association until 1953 when they formally recognized it. And it's being slowly absorbed into medicine. So if you go and do a Google search of osteopathy, you'll find um, that the people who pra osteopaths have a, a doctorate in osteopathy, they're doctors of osteopathy, DOs, and they're fully licensed. Um, and sort of operate at the same level of education as a, as a sort of traditional medical doctor. Homeo homeopathic medicine is a little bit different. Um, homeopathic medicine was developed in Germany in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And the idea here is that you can boost health and wellness and immunity with very small doses of natural substances. Um, the evidence is not supportive of homeopathy as a, um, as a treatment for particular diseases or disorders. So according to the National Institutes of Health, there is little evidence to support homeopathy as an effective treatment for any specific condition. But remember that your book points out that Complementary and alternative medicine is sometimes effective because the person believes that the treatment works and that belief helps the body heal itself. Also, if you were to ask a person who practices homeopathy, they probably would dismiss what the National Institutes of Health say because they might, for example, see them as a, a sort of medicalizing um, entity that is trying to encourage medicine, the medical institutions take over of um, well-being, right? Uh, but according to the NIH, which um, is well uh, regarded when it comes to health in mainstream medicine, there is little evidence to support the effects or the treatment of homeopathy. You have um, chiropractors. So chiropractic medicine is another form of complementary and alternative medicine um, established in 1895. Chiropractic medicine involves the manipulation of the spine um, to relieve pressure on nerves, which the argument is that that release of pressure on the nerves would then alleviate pain and illness more broadly. So in terms of the evidence, the research shows that chiropractic medicine does help back and shoulder pain, but there is less consistent evidence to show that it helps other ailments beyond that. Um, and actually, in 1987, um, a federal court ruled that the American Medical Association conspired to destroy chiropractic medicine in violation of antitrust statutes. So now you'll actually find that chiropractors can receive Medicare payments and treatment from chiropractors is typically covered by most major insurance policies. Then you have acupuncture, which is an ancient Chinese technique, which is actually still a central component of Chinese medicine. Um, and it involves inserting needles into specific points of the body to ease pain. 
and to stimulate bodily functions. So this is used by millions of Americans, most often for chronic pain. Um, research on the effects of acupuncture are ongoing. There are no conclusive results, meaning that there have not been many, many studies showing that it works. Um, it could, again, be a placebo effect, right? Your book talks about placebo effects where there's nothing happening physiologically or um, chemically in terms of changing the body, but that the placebo effect is enough the person believes that it works and that is enough to help the body heal. Then you have faith healing. Um, which is another form of complementary and alternative medicine that is actually quite commonly practiced um, in the U.S. So this is healing that occurs through divine intervention. In other words, God intervenes and takes the pain away. Um, you know, you might see this. So um, Pentecostal, Pentecostals is a it's a denomination of Christianity. Um, you may think of sort of this, what you see in the picture here, as an example of faith healing where um, a pastor or a reverend um, touches another person who is feeling ill and that God operates through that pastor or reverend to heal the person that they're touching. Um, if uh, so, So research on faith healing has shown that almost half of the people who are using CAM, right? Com complementary and alternative medicine. Almost half of the people who are doing that, and it's like, I don't know, 60%. When you include prayer, it's 60%. But almost half of those people are exclusively using prayer. So prayer is a huge component of CAM. Um, it depends on the study. Sometimes that's included in the definition of complementary and alternative medicine. Sometimes it's not. But prayer plays a huge role. Um, and actually, Christian scientists have used faith healing exclusively in place of traditional medicine, but they're sort of starting to get away from this practice a little bit because there have been a number, a number of um, convictions for manslaughter or neglect. Like if somebody in, like a child, for example, is ill and the parents pray or engage in faith healing according to their um, religious beliefs and the child um, passes away, there have been cases where the parents have been sued probably by the state um, for neglect, for not taking the child to um, a doctor, right, or some normatively accepted form of treatment. So the sort of margin this this is a is a sort of um, marginal or not widely accepted um, type of uh, treatment that you it really illustrates sort of the dominance of the medical model when it comes to treating illness and disability. But all of that being said, it seems to work. How complementary and alternative forms of medicine work is really not well understood, but research shows that people who use these kinds of alternative treatments are 15% more likely to rate their own health as excellent, and they're also 65% more likely to report that their health this year is better than it was last year. So that raises a lot of questions. Does it actually work? The research has not been conclusive. Maybe it's that people who use these kinds of approaches are actually different people who would have gotten healthy anyway, Right? So rather than having a placebo effect, you might find that people attribute their improvement in health to, to these complementary and alternative me forms of medicine when in fact it was just inevitably going to happen that they were going to um, get healthier anyway. Or it might be a placebo effect where they really believe that this is working and that belief, that positivity has sort of allowed the body to heal itself. That's, that's what your book is talking about when she talks about the placebo effect. So it's working. We have no idea how or why. We have very little understanding of exactly how these kinds of medicines work, what they're doing for um, people to help them improve their health. 
whatever it is, there is a greater acceptance of these alternative forms of medicine. In the early parts of the 20th century, the um, belief in the medical institution was so strong, and, and it still is pretty strong today. But as I said earlier, you're starting to see um, a movement a little bit away from from this traditional form of medicine. People are moving outside of that um, model of medicine to seek alternative forms. And so these CAMs are being more widely accepted, whether that's that's indicated not only through public opinion, that people think that, that's a, that these are suitable ways to seek treatment, but also there's been increased funding on complementary and alternative medicine. Um, it's being incorporated into medical practice um, you'll see at a lot of major hospitals that they have some, some center maybe for alternative medicine, right? So I live in Cleveland. The Cleveland Clinic has a, a whole building dedicated to this kind of complementary and alternative medicine, integrative medicine, it's sometimes called. Um, and actually acceptance of these alternative treatments is highest among middle and working class people as well as middle-aged and younger adults. Um, so that's just a brief outline of the kinds of complementary and alternative medicines that Weitz is talking about in your textbook. Um, the, other, the, the other thing I thought it was important to mention is that with the rise of the internet, right, well, you know, it doesn't seem like a rise to us because it's been coming on, but if you think about the life of the internet over the last like 30 or 40 years, people's ability to diagnose their own symptoms has really increased. And so on one hand, it's given people another way to seek alternatives to, to, to traditional medicine. So it could be cost saving, it could be empowering, right? People have more with the internet, they're, they're able to go out and look for themselves. It, it gives them a sense of self-efficacy, right? And so they can um, look for, di like, enter their symptoms in and, and try to find a diagnosis for what's happening. And then maybe that helps them go to the doctor um, uh, with more information. Um, they can seek out support groups that can help them um, figure out what their problem is. Maybe they haven't been able to figure out with their symptoms what's going on with a, with a Google search or whatever, but that support groups can really help them. And sometimes um, the internet allows them to cut doctors out of testing of some kinds of disease, like your book gives the example of celiac disease. Now, the internet itself will offer criticism of this, right? And if you are somebody who has ever Googled your own symptoms, you know that it doesn't always go well, right? So sometimes you type it into WebMD and it comes back and says that you've got something really serious. I have heard from many people, don't Google it. Don't look at it just go to the doctor. So it depends on sort of how you see it. Um, there are obviously pluses and minuses to being able to, to have all this information at your fingertips without the training that all of these um, traditional do do people who work in traditional medicine, people who work in alternative medicine, all have some kind of training. Um, most have some kind of training that the lay person doesn't have, right? So um, all of this is sort of just an aside on how people seek treatment. Um, in the next lecture, I will talk more about um, the idea of labeling with illnesses. We talked a little bit about that last week with the social with, with um, our discussion of the social construction of illness, but I'm going to focus more on this idea of labeling, what happens when you label, um, the kinds of prejudice, dis discrimination, and stigma that people with um, illnesses face and how they have been able, able to over, overcome that stigma. So that is part two of this week's lecture, and I will see you then.